This is the Georgia Farm Monitor. Since 1966, your source for state and national agribusiness news and features for farmers and consumers about Georgia's number one industry, agriculture. The Georgia Farm Monitor is produced by the state's largest general farm organization, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now, here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. Well, the holidays are officially over, so is all the overindulgence, yes. thank goodness, but one thing never changes, and that's the Georgia Farm Monitor. Hi again to you, so glad you tuned in to another edition of the show. I'm Ray D'Alessio. And I'm Kenny Bergamy. As always, we've got a great show for you. Now, coming up, as the nation's pecan growers prepare to vote on a new marketing order, what does it mean for the industry if it is passed? Also on the program, hard to believe, but it's been a year since Georgia Senator Saxby Chambliss retired from office. Now that he's part of the private sector, the Monitor staff sat down with him to see what the former senator has been doing since he's been out of government. And then later, although they claim to be simple folk, see how the owners of Hillside Orchard Farm run a very tight and sophisticated operation that caters to businesses across the country. All this and more starting right now on the Georgia Farm Monitor. With Georgia producing more poultry than any other state in the country, the Department of Agriculture has taken a possible avian influenza outbreak very seriously. During the Georgia Farm Bureau's annual convention in Jekyll Island, Damon Jones spoke to state leaders about the issue and gives you the latest update as to what producers can expect and what they can do to help lower the risk of possible contamination. This time last year, the nation was in a panic as a number of states were affected by the avian influenza, a disease that carries with it a 95% mortality rate for the birds that are infected. And while the disease does look to have been somewhat contained, departments around the state are still taking the threat very seriously. High pathogenic avian influenza was last found within the country in June uh, in a wild bird. So uh, since that time, we've been in Georgia preparing uh, in case this virus does come back to the United States and come to Georgia. So we've been working very, very hard to, to be prepared for when that happens. One of the big reasons for all the panic was the lack of information on the topic. That's why the Georgia Department of Agriculture is making an effort to answer some of the key questions being asked. Am I going to get sick? Are my kids going to get sick? Are my dogs going to get sick? Th that's number one that they're going to be concerned about. Number two is the welfare of the animals that we are having to deal with. You know, how are we handling this issue? How are we going to dispose of the birds? That's another big question that a lot of people have. It's also important farmers relay some of the information they learn to those in their everyday life. What they need to realize is that it could be at the guy at Walmart, the person sitting next to him at the Waffle House, the lady at the bank, their truck driver that's bringing the feed to them on the farm. Those people may talk to the media. So it's really important that our communication messages, whoever we're talking to, are clear and concise and accurate and consistent to make sure that the message is that way as well. They say an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, and that's especially the case here as producers can help mitigate their risk of an outbreak by paying close attention to what is coming on and off their farm. You draw a line in the sand and what's on your side of the line you control. The world's on the other side of the line. So what crosses that line, you clean, you disinfect, and you prevent things from crossing that line that you don't want to cross. That's biosecurity. We can't stop the birds from coming. We can't stop the birds from bringing avian influenza virus. But we can stop the virus from getting into our poultry. Unfortunately, biosecurity can be time consuming and costly. However, Cobb says it is certainly worth all the effort and will have other benefits besides warding off this virus. In the state of Georgia, since we have increased our outreach to, to all these uh, grower groups uh, about biosecurity, normal everyday things that have been plaguing uh, the poultry industry uh, in a routine kind of way have all gone down. So biosecurity works. Reporting from Jekyll Island, I'm Damon Jones for the Georgia Farm Monitor. All right, Damon, thank you very much. Now, meantime, January, of course, means the beginning of the Georgia General Assembly for state lawmakers. It also means the Georgia Farm Bureau Legislative Department, hard at work for you, the farmer. And this year, they have added a new voice to the team. She's ABAC grad and Georgia native, Jenna Saxon. In addition to serving as the 2011 Georgia Watermelon Queen, Jenna previously served with the Georgia Fruit and Vegetable Association and most recently with Commissioner Black's office at the Georgia Department of Agriculture. 
Well, I just knew from a very young age that I wanted to be involved in agriculture. Um, I grew up on a farm from a farm family um, and uh, I was kind of always um, passionate about agriculture and um, you know the people who grow our food every day and 4-H and FFA really kind of um, helped um, drive that passion, I guess you could say. And so I knew, I knew early on that I wanted to be involved in agriculture. And um, fortunately, I was blessed with the opportunity to work for the Georgia Fruit and Vegetable Growers Association with Mr. Charles Hall right after graduation. And then uh, for the last three and a half years, I've worked for Commissioner Gary Black at the Georgia Department of Ag. And then now I'm here with Georgia Farm Bureau. So um, I think everything happens for a reason. I think it's just worked out really well and I'm very blessed. All right, and it goes without saying, we are thrilled to have Jenna aboard, so congratulations to her. And just a reminder, the Georgia General Assembly lasts a total of 40 working days. The GFB Legislative Department will have a representative in Atlanta every one of those days looking out for you, the farmer, and keeping us up to speed with the very latest from the state capitol. Kenny? All right, Ray, thanks so much. Pecan growers in Georgia and around the country are preparing to vote on a new national marketing order. The industry hopes this measure, if passed, will greatly enhance the industry's marketing efforts and keep pecan growing profitable for generations to come. The Monitor's Mark Wildman has that report. The president of the U.S. Pecan Growers Council, Randy Hudson, has been traveling around recently educating growers on the proposed national marketing order for pecans. At the Georgia Farm Bureau's annual convention on Jekyll Island, he got an opportunity to visit with Georgia producers and explain how this new policy could help the industry. Well, what the marking order does is it allows the farmers uh, and the industry to help support itself. You know, the idea of con contributing monies, particularly for, uh, you know, for marketing, it's, it's good to go out and say, hey, let's all put some money in the pot and let's do some marketing. And what we found out is, although you've got people that certainly would be willing to do that, the idea of being able to connect, to collect sufficient amounts of funds to be able to impact the, the demand for pecans takes a lot more money than we could just simply raise by asking for voluntary contributions. The new assessment would be between one to three cents a pound of pecans depending on quality. And the funds will be used to market pecans and help the industry create more demand for their product. Collected funds will be used uh, and managed uh, by council. Uh, this council will be elected. It will be composed of growers and processors from across the United States. It will be a 17-member council. Uh, there will be three growers out of the southeastern United States that will be on that council, pecan growers. Producers who grow 25 acres or more of pecans or have a four-year average of greater than 50,000 pounds per year qualify to vote on the referendum and producers are encouraged to keep up with the process. If you will go to AmericanPecanBoard.com, uh, there are copies of the referendum uh, or, the, or the marketing order, the draft marketing order, and to get the specifics of what's in the order. Uh, beyond that, uh, there will be information coming out through Farm Bureau News, uh, through the Cooperative Extension Services, through, uh, you know, through other ag entities, uh, for, through pub, public information in, in the near future, I'm sure. Pecans have been an exciting story in Georgia and around the nation. With their popularity growing in China, growers have seen demand rise. And now, those in the industry feel this new marketing order can keep that momentum going and keep future generations growing profitable pecan crops. I'm very bullish on it, as evidenced by the fact that, you know, we're planting a lot of pecans in Georgia. And I'm not the only one bullish in Georgia on the pecan industry. If you look around the state, uh, we're planting thousands of acres of pecans. And we're not the only area of the country that's doing that. And uh, you know, supply is going to be an issue unless we can increase demand. And this marketing order gives us an opportunity to in fact go out, market our pecans, and create this demand that's going to be necessary to use up this supply that we know is coming. For the Georgia Farm Monitor, I'm Mark Wildman. All right, Mark, great job as always, sir. When the show continues, we sit down with former Georgia Senator Saxby Chambliss, how life has changed after all those years working in our nation's capital. Stay tuned. All right, we welcome you back to the Georgia Farm Monitor. Of course, it's been one year since Saxby Chambliss left the U.S. Senate when he decided to retire and take a job in the private sector. 
Now, recently, the former U.S. Senator sat down with our own Kenny Bergamy and said, among other things, he likes the change of pace. Well, Kenny, life has been good in life after the Senate. I have thoroughly enjoyed my association with DLA Piper, which is a global law firm, and they've given me the exact platform I wanted to be able to take advantage of my contacts, both domestically as well as overseas, and I've been very fortunate over the last 20 years to meet some pretty interesting people, and now I'm having a chance to go back and not just develop business with those folks, but to have a chance to talk about what's going on in the world right on. I'm still very much involved in the world of intelligence. Um, I'm uh, on a couple of uh, intelligence community boards and focused on cybersecurity in my law practice. And it's, it's been a lot of fun, and yet I still have a great appreciation for what a dangerous world it is. And, while I miss my friends in D.C., uh, frankly, I, I like what I'm doing much better than what they're doing day to day. Mm -hmm. um, folks in Georgia know and understand I come from the heart of ag country. Cochran County has always been known as the most diversified agricultural county in the state. And my friends are all farmers or related to the agribusiness community somehow. So I have, have had a great foundation in agriculture and I learned a lot during my years of law practice about not just commodity programs, but about how farming operations work. And that was so beneficial to me once I got to Washington. I, I'm just so proud of the whole agriculture community and particularly my farmers individually. Today we introduce you to the new head of the Georgia Forestry Association. Andre Viegas, he's been on the job the last three months and said he's excited about the future of Georgia's forestry industry. Last October, Andres Viegas began his tenure as the new president of the Georgia Forestry Association. Following a national search, the Bogota, Colombia native brings more than 16 years of experience to a job that's designed to educate public officials and decision makers about the benefits derived from Georgia's working forests. Sure, yeah. So for me, it's been, a, like I said, a humbling honor to be able to be here back home and in Georgia to bring my family home as well. Uh, and we've been going around the state of Georgia and doing a lot of town hall, town hall meetings, uh, events that we call Forestry Forward events. And as we do that, we've been asking a lot of the community uh, just three general questions. You know, what do we do well? Uh, what can we do better? And where do you want to see us in five years? And for us, and for me in particular, that's very critical because what we really want to do is make sure that our association is absolutely pointing in the direction of where our members think we need to be. And we want to be able to make sure that we're delivering value not only immediately in the next few years, but also 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the road. And a lot of that, whether it's the advocacy work that we do for, through the foundation, or whether it's the membership benefits that we bring to our members, or whether that's the education, outreach, um, and research and leadership development that we do through our foundation. All those are part of our near and long-term plans and we really want to hear from people around the state, be they members or not, as to what, uh, what we can be doing to make sure that we deliver uh, you know, a future for forestry in the state. After positions with Weyerhaeuser Corporation, Langdale Industries and the Georgia Department of Agriculture, Viegas told us his new role with the Forestry Association is a perfect fit uh, initially, I guess it started uh, in, in March, at the end of March, and a friend of mine, Brian Toller at the Georgia Agribusiness Council, sent me an email uh, announcing the, the search. And uh, both he was, he was excited and I was very excited. Uh, and it really kind of started the process. And I had the opportunity to talk to a lot of my friends in the forest products industry, people I used to work with when I was here uh, previously, uh, before, before uh, joining Weyerhaeuser, and really had the opportunity to, to explore the, opportun the, the job. And with that, uh, you know, I got excited about the opportunity to come back home to Georgia. I grew up in Athens, and I, uh, you know, this is a state I love. I also had the opportunity to work with friends and people that I respect across the forest products industry, but also in agriculture uh, and natural resources. In addition to overall management responsibilities, Viegas' role will be that of a spokesman and cheerleader for those connected to forestry. He'll be the association's chief lobbyist, providing daily representation for the forestry community while the Georgia General Assembly is in session. Uh, we are uh, you know, the, one of the oldest conservation groups in the, in the United States. Uh, you know, we're growing more trees today in Georgia than we had 50 or 100 years ago. Uh, so we've become uh, you know, really one of the leading uh, 
uh, industries out there uh, promoting a lot of the environmental benefits uh, that forestry can bring to our, to our state, our citizens, and our nation. The new president of the forestry community said he's pleased that now the industry he loves so much is beginning to see benefits of working with environmental groups. And so we, we're working very closely, I think, uh, with the environmental community because they really understand that message today. We've gotten so much, we've gotten, gone, come such a long way from that original message of, you know, never cut a tree to where we are today, which is much more about sustainability. We understand that uh, we need trees. They're a part of our life. They're in the homes we live in. They're in the paper products that we use every single day. They're even in uh, cell phone uh, covers and in, in, the, in the glass that, uh, that's on our cell phones and TVs. Uh, so they're, they're a part of our everyday life, and more importantly, we understand that uh, it, it's a renewable resource. It's something that we can grow forever as long as we pr protect the economic drivers and the, the ability of landowners to continue growing and planting trees and doing, them in a, doing it in a way that's sustainable. All right, time for another quick break. Now, still to come on the program, meet the owners of Hillside Orchard Farms who say despite their incredible success, their love of Georgia agriculture and not money is what keeps them going. Stay tuned. Well, I think it's a real gem for Milan and for West Tennessee. Antique tractors and trucks, plows and pieces of equipment, an old country store, and a beautiful dress worn by a young settler lady. Steeped in history and heritage, the West Tennessee Agricultural Museum offers a journey through time. The farm life of past generations is on exhibit here with 2,500 artifacts, pictures and paintings, a feature on wildlife, and lessons about agriculture. Uh, we've got thousands of, of items and artifacts in this museum that kind of show how uh, life was lived 100 years ago or so. I tell people often I've been in here a thousand times and every time I come in I see something I've never seen before. Dr. Blake Brown is director of the UT Ag Research Center in Milan where the museum is housed. One of Brown's predecessors started this effort, Tom McCutcheon, the first superintendent of the Milan station who had a love of antique farm equipment. Today the museum is enjoyed by thousands of visitors. Here the crowd at UT Ag Research's Fall Jamboree. Much of what you see has been donated, and Brown says it's up to this generation to preserve history. You know, I tell people, I think Tom McCutcheon would be proud of what we've done with it. Uh, his goal was to preserve this old heritage from, from early West Tennessee, and I think we're doing a good job of that. We called it stuff. Mother and I called it stuff. It was pride and joy for him, but it was stuff. He had a dream, and his dream came true. The building that houses the museum is now nearly three decades old and needed some improvements. Renovations are now underway, all to make the experience better for visitors. Upgrades to the 16,000 square foot building include greater access for people with disabilities as well as new lights and climate control improvements. Uh, we had uh, limped along with our heating and air systems and fortunately got some, some capital maintenance money to replace completely replace the heating and air. Uh, we've replaced all the lights with more energy efficient lighting. Add to that shaping up the exterior of the building and the work will be done soon. If you had to name a capital of West Tennessee farming, Milan would be in the running. The museum with its coming improvements is a real treasure for the town, the region's agricultural roots proudly on display. This is Charles Denny reporting. Well, finally today, although it's true there's no I in team, there are in fact two I's in Hillside Orchard Farms. And it's because of teamwork that this North Georgia business is able to produce over 700 jams and jellies for companies across the U.S. And that's only one third of their operation. Having spent the day with owners Robert and Patsy Mitchum, I came away thinking, A, these are some really good people, and B, their work is far from over. They say that behind every great man is a great woman. Something Robert Mitchum will be the first to admit is definitely true in his case. However, he's also the first to point out that great doesn't even begin to describe his wife and best friend, Patsy. Patsy has been at the beginning and, and she has basically run the, uh, all the bookkeeping, all the office staff, all the labeling, 
a lot of times you did run the labels and put the labels on while I made the product. So it, uh, we started off very humble, and because we're still humble in what we got here, uh, sometimes we can't keep up with it, but that's, that's what you always wish for. I grew up in Tiger in this area. He grew up in South Georgia and has always been worked with FFA. And just in, enjoying the, fam, the people of the farm and, and the people around us that we see every day, especially down here at the store, and meeting our customers at the gift shows or at the farm markets or you know, the different places. We've, we've made a lot of good friends over the years. A lot of friends and a number of good business decisions. Family owned and operated for over 30 years, Hillside Orchard Farms is more than just your typical agritourism destination. In fact, the 100 acres of apples, blackberries, muscadines, and more isn't even Robert Mitchum's proudest accomplishment. No, it's the canning factory, which produces over 700 jams, jellies, and ciders combined. We're into some other stuff out here where we'll take the, the waste from the, the cider making and all the other ciders that we do all of the other dams and jellies and everything else we do and make brandy out of it. It's just an end product of an end product of an end product of an end product. And the last end product of it is when we make cow feed out of what's left. And then it starts over again. We make hamburger out of cows. <laughs> but that's, that's what farming is, is that you get everything out of everything that you can get. And when you make money is when you don't throw anything away. Well, really the canning operation started about 83. So we've worked together. We built a jelly pl uh, sh shop or a little jelly plant in our backyard. And it's expanded till our house is in the front yard now. Good or bad, you're there with it every day. You go, you know, you can walk out any time of day and go to work if you want to, or you can go home because we're right next door. We have customers all over the United States, some in Bermuda, different places like that. We ship every day. Uh, we private label so much of our product. Uh, we do hillside products, but with our private labeling, we do the contract packaging, which we developed over the years. And that's where you've got your special barbecue sauce, and we'll make it for you. You do the marketing, but we'll make it. And one could say the Mitchums have made it many times over. Their love of money, however, not even close to the love and passion they have for agriculture. Uh, the biggest thing that has, has hurt me in what I have, I'm doing, and it also hurts Miss Patsy, is that I keep reinvesting. And we get bigger and bigger and bigger. And she says, when do we stop and enjoy some of the money? I said, I don't know. But as long as there's an opportunity, I want to exploit that opportunity. And I want to do what I can do with that opportunity because that's what keeps me alive, is reaching out there to do something else with what other people can't do nothing with. Really fun time indeed. Well, that's going to do it for this week's edition of the Georgia Farm Monitor. Here's a reminder for all the latest ag info regarding food, great recipes, and what's happening down on the farm. Be sure and check out our Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest pages. You'll stay informed and see what's up in the world of farming, plus here on the Farm Monitor Show. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next week right here on the Georgia Farm Monitor. Have a great week, everybody.